Um, so, I'm going to talk to you today about Project Coral, which is a, a research project I'm running in South East London at, uh, at the Horniman Museum. And it's focusing on reproducing corals in captivity and working with the scientific community um, to use captive reproduction as a tool um, really to investigate the impacts of climate change on, on coral reefs worldwide. But first, you know, what, what are corals? Well, they um, are under the phylum Cnidaria, so they're closely related to jellyfish, sea anemones. Um, and they're broadly split into soft corals on the left-hand side, uh, a soft coral, and then the hard corals. It's the hard corals that are the reef-building corals. They lay down a, a calcium carbonate skeleton, and then something called a polyp basically sits inside that calcium carbonate cup almost. And those, um, those polyps um, can be an individual polyp. A coral can be just one polyp, like this one at the bottom. This is a, a fungia coral, sort of half the size of a football. Um, or much more commonly, uh, colonial organisms. So this, um, this large table forming uh, coral is made up of hundreds of thousands of individual polyps that make up the colony. Um, and they look like this, the, the, the polyps, you can see multiple um, small polyp, um, sea anemone looking uh, type of units. And they, the coral um, has many different colors and actually it's the uh, relationship that the coral has with an algae that lives inside the tissue of the coral. So here we have a close up of the, of the polyps here and all these little brown dots are individual algae cells. It's a symbiotic relationship that these algae live within the coral. They provide about 80% of the food for the coral comes from this algae in, in the form of simple amino acids. And as the coral processes these amino acids, they break down into nitrogen and, and phosphate, uh, phosphorus waste, which is then a fertilizer for the, uh, for the algae. So it's a close relationship. And really, it's this relationship that determines um, the distribution of coral reefs. Tropical coral reefs are found in warm, sunlit waters. And that's predominantly because of this, this zooxanthellae that lives inside the coral. Um, so they come in a huge a range of, of size and growth forms from branching, plating, what's called massive corals, these sort of large brain corals. Um, big range of, of colors, again, uh, from, that, from that association with the zooxanthellae. And it's really the intricate structure that the coral um, forms in their different growth patterns that provides the three-dimensional structure of a coral reef. So, uh, and it's this three-dimensional structure that allows a huge diversity of life to occur on coral reefs. So coral reefs represent just 0.1% of the ocean floor, but a quarter of all marine life that occurs in the oceans occur on coral reefs. So they are absolutely jam-packed with life. And it's really the, the corals that are the foundation for this diversity to occur. So a myriad of species from nudibranch, shrimps, um, sponges, starfish, cuttlefish are all there because of, of the coral themselves. So they are integral to the coral reef environment. Huge diversity of fish obviously associated with, with reefs as well, of amazing colours, growth forms, patterns. And those in turn are fed on by larger predatory fish like this grouper or, or um, trevally. Things like turtles feed on either the seagrass beds or actually on the coral themselves. And then you have large migratory species like the, the big whale shark that comes into coral reefs to, to feed on the rich plankton that gets produced during um, certain periods of the year. When corals spawn and fish are breeding, you know, this, this large ocean going species will come into the reef to, to feed their planktivores, largest fish on the planet. So it's all related and all um, integrally linked to, to the reefs themselves. So coral reefs are globally important habitats. They, like I say, they represent a very small percentage of the ocean floor. Huge number of, um, of the diversity of the oceans occur in them. But they're not just important biologically, they're also important from a human perspective. So about 7% of the world's population rely on coral reefs. 
for the services they provide, whether it's a protein source through, through fishing. Importantly, because of the structure of the reef, they're very efficient at diffusing wave energy that's hitting the, hitting the coastline. So, you know, coral reefs diffuse wave energy like a tsunami will dissipate that energy and stop coastal erosion. So you lose the coral reef and then you have increased coastal erosion. And importantly as well is tourism, you know, uh, providing income into your know, island nations. And when you um, sort of tot up all of the, the services that they provide, it's about $10 trillion a year. So when you compare, say, the, the GDP of, of the US, for instance, it's about $16 trillion. China, about $8 trillion. So if you combine the world's reefs, they would be equivalent to the second largest nation on, on Earth in terms of the amount of income that they, they generate. So that's all the great stuff about coral reefs. There's major issues going on in the world's reefs at the moment. Um, through um, you know, a, a number of causes. So the, the current estimate is 30% of the world's reefs are what are called functionally extinct. They may never recover from the state that they're in. Um, and the proje projections are moving forward that this is going to be exacerbated as a result of human activity. So those pressures can be largely split into localized pressures, um, things like pollution, overfishing, sedimentation, so as we clear rainforests on the land for, for growing things like palm oil. Um, the rain then washes off the soil into the rivers, the rivers then put it onto the reef, and that smothers, smothers the reef, it increased, increases something called turbidity. So that blocks the light getting to the, the zooxanthellae inside the coral, and in essence, the coral can starve. And all of these things lead to increased disease outbreaks. So these are some of the local pressures that the coral reefs are facing. And then there's you know, the much broader um, climate problems of, of climate change leading to things like ocean acidification. Um, so these two pictures on the left-hand side, they're of the same reef in Guam. Um, the one on the left-hand side I, I took in 2013, and then the picture on the right is literally one year later. So it was taken last year. Huge amount of loss in just a single year. Um, and this, um, this loss um, predominantly is down to um, a, a symptom of climate change, which is called coral bleaching. So as we increase the water temperature, and it only needs to be a few degrees above the upper threshold, it breaks the relationship down that the coral has with this algae. So the algae, like I say, provides about 80% of the food. It also provides the color for the coral. So during periods of extended warming of the ocean, this relationship breaks down, the algae leaves the coral, and what you see is the white calcium carbonate skeleton of the coral with a thin living layer, translucent layer over the top. Now the coral can still survive that for short periods, and if the temperature drops back down, the algae can recolonize back into the coral and it can survive. The problem is, is if that period of warming is extended, then in essence the coral starves. Once the coral starves, um, it, it, it obviously dies. The, um, the structure that it, it builds uh, becomes brittle and it breaks down. So all of that huge diversity that's associated with reefs subsequently drops as well. So you may have noticed in the news last week that um, a lot of news agencies picked up on this story that um, the project, proje uh, projections are that this year is going to be a major bleaching um, event, a global bleaching event. So in um, recorded history, so far we've gone through two major global bleaching events that affected the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Ocean. And 98 was the, the first major uh, global bleaching event, and 11% of the world's reefs died in that single year. So it was you know, catastrophic. Projections are for, for this year and leading into 2016, it looks like this is going to be even bigger than the 98 event. So it's incredibly topical at the moment, um, and it's worrying. It's a very worrying prediction. So the, the dark um, red areas are uh, sea surface temperature that leads to this, this, um, you know, this stress response called coral bleaching. 
And then we look at uh, the projections moving into the early part of the next year, you can see how widespread it is, right where across the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and the Atlantic there. And it's driven by a weather system called El Nino. So it's integrally linked to that. So this has got a lot of um, conservationists, coral biologists, very worried about what's going to happen next year. So this is um, you know, a, a reef. I was very lucky to live in Borneo for, for six months, um, about 15 years ago. And this image was taken about five years after the bleaching event. So the structure that that reef um, had, that 3D vertical structure, became brittle, broken down, and now it's rubble. And so there's very little um, associated life linked to that. Now, the only way that this can recover, and reefs do recover, so you know, the 98 bleaching event, the Maldives, for instance, experienced something like a 90% mortality rate in that single year. But they actually bounce back very, very quickly. Um, and there's something called connection. So reefs can be connected not just locally, but across entire oceans. So the, the theory is with the Maldives, the why it bounced back so quickly, is you have this circular current going around the Indian Ocean. And the west coast of, of Malaysia, Thailand, were protected the reefs there because of cool, upwelling waters protecting them from the bleaching event. Then when they reproduced, the larvae, which is the, the planktonic stage, which I'm going to go on about in a minute, travel right the way across the Indian Ocean and resettled and allowed the Maldives to bounce back incredibly quickly. So reefs can recover from these events, but reproductively fit populations of coral need to be connected to the damaged reef. So understanding reproduction is really important in terms of understanding what will happen to reefs after these big climatic events and, and potentially what will happen to them in the future. The, so understanding reproduction. So scleractinians are, the, are the, the hard corals. These are the reef-forming corals. Um, they have a number of reproductive modes. Um, they can asexually reproduce. You break a branch off during storm damage and that branch can attach itself back to the reef and grow a clone of the colony it's been removed from. So that's one way that coral reefs have evolved to populate themselves. But then sexual reproduction is the way that obviously genetic material is, is mixed. So with the scleractina, the, the hard corals, they're broadly split into two reproductive modes. One called the brooders, which are about a quarter of all corals. Um, and they're characterized by um, internal fertilization, so eggs and, and, and sperm fuse internally and form something called the larvae. It looks like a little tic-tac shaped thing. These guys down at the bottom um, are larvae. <coughs> and the brooders um, can produce larvae throughout the whole year. It's still linked to the lunar cycles. You have peaks and troughs throughout the lunar cycle, but they can produce all year long. But it's a lower amount of material. Um, but they still are continuously reseeding local reefs. And then the remaining, um, or the largest group of the broadcast spawners, and these are the ones that are characterized by these mass spawning events that occur just over a few nights a year. The Great Barrier Reef is probably the best known of those. Um, and so the, it's an evolutionary adaptation to, to um, link your spawning time so that um, many corals are hermaphrodites, they can be gonogaristic or um, hermaphrodites, and they need to swap. Um, you know, sperm sperm from one colony needs to fuse with with eggs from another, so that fertilization can occur. the 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 problem is, is sperm isn't buoyant, but the eggs are buoyant. They're filled with lipids, fats. So the hermaphrodite corals um, produce an egg sperm bundle. So you have um, a whole load of eggs around the outside with a sperm package in the middle. And by timing, saying a, a coral's at this side and, and, and another the other side, by timing the, the release of those at the same moment, the lipid-filled eggs take all the um, material up to the water surface. Then ocean currents form something called the slick. And then enzyme activity breaks that bundle apart, liberating the sperm out so that the fusion between individuals can, can occur. So this is a bundle breaking apart, and you can just see sperm being liberated out, um, out of the center there. 
<clears throat> but spawning events can be synchronous. So the Great Barrier Reef is what's called a, a synchronous spawning location where the whole reef community goes over just a couple of nights a year. So in the inshore reef, it's between four and six days after the full moon in November. And the outer shore reef is, uh, again, four to six days in November. So you know, if you time your diving around these periods, you can see you know, that all of these gametes being released. And other areas of the world are asynchronous. So, so Kenya has an asynchronous pattern with maybe the same species going over several months and certainly uh, different species almost throughout the year. So the work I'm doing is working with synchronous spawning because I can then pinpoint the moment in time that I think things should be going in the wild and then um, uh, replicate those things in captivity. And this is just the life cycle. So we have um, you know, the, the small fragment here uh, that grows into the adult colony. They release these egg sperm bundles Fusion occurs externally to form this larvae, and this is the free swimming part. It can travel across oceans, settle, and then ultimately grow back into um, a colony. So really the goals that we're trying to do with Project Coral, um, to get corals to spawn is incredibly difficult. Um, there have been more spawning events in captivity, but it's always been accidental. So when I started thinking about this, um, really wanted to go right back to the drawing board. So any animal that's bred in an aquarium or zoo, the principle is exactly the same. You've got to look at what happens in the wild and then replicate those, ca those conditions in captivity. So you trigger seasonality, which often leads to reproduction. So that's exactly what we were doing with, with the corals. And the idea behind that is Currently, the research community that are trying to understand reproduction and the impacts of climate change, um, they have to remove corals, say, a week before the spawning date out in the wild, study them in the lab, and then they have to wait a whole year for the next spawning. So what we're trying to do is develop reliable protocols that, that we can break the whole season and have spawning on cue when we want it. So it can then open up more areas of climate change research and understand um, where you know, reefs will be in the future. And then also potentially developing techniques for aquaculture of corals. So, you know, people keep corals in their home aquarium. It's a multi-billion dollar industry worldwide. It's huge. You know, could these um, techniques be used to sustainably harvest, provide high value goods to developing nations, and in essence, farm, farm the reefs in, into, you know, the aquarium industry. So how do you breed a coral? Well, when I started thinking about this, really about 10 years ago, but I, I really put it in place, I suppose, at the end of 2012, that first, the colony size is going to be important. So each individual species of coral has a set size it needs to hit before it starts producing eggs and sperm. Before that, it's putting all its energy into growth to stabilizing itself on, on the reef. And then, something called heterotrophic feeding. So they gain 80% of their food from, from these algae, from the symbiotic relationship, but the remaining 20% comes from prey capture. So they have very um, strong stinging cells, corals, much the same way as a jellyfish or a sea anemone do, and they use that to capture phytoplankton, uh, zooplankton in the water column. And that's important for providing the nutrition that's needed for for the egg production predominantly. And once you've got those two factors in play, the theory is that the seasonal change in temperature is the first trigger to, to stimulate the coral to start putting energy into egg production. And then as you get closer to um, the day of spawning, I mentioned that you know, corals have to synchronize when they go. Well, the mechanism to that is the interplay between the photo period, so as the sun is setting, and then the interplay between the lunar cycle. So each day you move past the, the full moon, the absolute period of darkness extends by about 50 minutes each day. And the corals have um, cryptochromes, a protein in them that is sensitive to this absolute period of darkness. So that's why on the Great Barrier Reef, for instance, you can pretty much set your watch by when a, one species will go um, because they're sensitive to this period of darkness. 
So what we've done at the museum is we use microprocessors to control our aquariums and we use LED lighting. So as the sun rises, for instance, in Singapore, our LEDs start ramping up and stimulates the, the rise in the sun. The same with the lunar cycle, same with the temperature. It will trigger the heaters to go on and off. So we replicate the, the environments that the corals have come from using, using technology. And it can control it remotely um, via my phone. Um, it's an amazing bit of technology. It's really opened up what we can do with, um, with closed systems. So once we've got all that in place, we need to start checking the corals. So at the moment, what we're trying to do with, in terms of developing the, the protocols is using branching corals because they provide an opportunity to see egg production and sperm production throughout the year. So you basically break a piece of, of coral off. And what we're looking here is through the cross section of that branch. So the white areas here are, are white eggs. It takes between three to six months for an egg to become fully mature, ready to, uh, ready to um, <coughs> be released. And we can tell by the size of the, coral, uh, size of the egg and then the color of it at what stage it's at, ready to be released. And the picture on the left here is, um, is, you can see it's sort of getting orange, pink pigmentation. We know once it's pigmented like that, that it's gonna go after the next full moon. So what we do is we preserve those in formalin. We then decalcify the, the calcium carbonate structure and melt that with an acid. Then fix the um, soft tissue in a, in a, a resin block and then shave um, uh, using a microtome, basically shave um, slices off and mount those up on a microscope slide. Stain them and then the stain then um, tells us what, what our material we're looking at. So the pink area are eggs developing and then the purple area is, is sperm developing. So we, it gives us a really good library of um, stage of development. We can cross-reference that then with the environmental data that the, um, the microprocessors are controlling. So it, the, <coughs> the top picture is a, an individual polyp. So we're looking at about a couple of millimeters across. This is a cross-section of the tentacles here. This is the mouth of the polyp, and then we have two eggs in the bundle. This is moments before it's being released. So this was in 2013. And then this is something called the mesenterine filament. So each um, tentacle of a, of a polyp has a, a digestive filament called the mesenterine, and the gonad is located around the mesenterine. So um, scleractinians are, are divisions of six, so you have 12 tentacles um, in, a, in a polyp, and it basically goes sperm, egg, sperm, egg, sperm, egg, around the polyp. So along this mesenterine, these dots here are sperm cells starting to develop um, on, uh, in the gonad there. <coughs> so hopefully this video is going to play. So this is the, the first two spawning events that we had. Um, Back in 2013, so we, I literally um, had corals for about 10 years. I know they'd never spawned um, through regular sampling. And then we put all of this in, in this motion, uh, all these factors in play. And within eight months, we got them gravid and then releasing, releasing egg sperm bundles into, into, wild, uh, into the aquarium. We're still the first and only institution in the world to do this, so it's, it's amazing. Um, breakthrough and really that kind of led to the formation of, of Project Coral and, and diversifying what we're trying to do with this. So what you get early indication that spawning is going to happen is something called setting where the, the egg sperm bundles come up into the mouth of the, of the coral. That's what these sort of orange areas are here. The coral before that released about 200,000 eggs in 20 minutes. And then this one is uh, about 70,000 eggs. So they produce a huge amount of material in a very short period of time. And then that's it for, for a whole year. They'll um, they have to build up the energy to start again. It was a single genotype of each, each one of these. So we've not managed to work with in vitro fertilization yet, but I've um, I work out in the field with a, an organization I'm going to talk about in a minute. And we 
we do exactly that. We take egg sperm bundles and we mix sperm and eggs from individual colonies to create the crosses that, that are needed to, um, to you know, create young coral in essence. So based on that, we, we set up Project Coral. And what we wanted to do is focus on specific areas of the world. So our first project is, is Project Coral Singapore. And we're working with international partners. We spend about eight months getting um, government permits um, to collect corals from Singapore and bring them back to London. Um, I'll talk about that project in a minute. Cairns is just coming online. So we're running a prototype um, or a pilot study this year and looking at fleshing that out um, more in next year. And then the, the next study site will possibly be Guam. We've got good links there. But it's very difficult getting the CITES permits for corals to come out of Guam. So there's going to be a few years worth of work on that. And really the idea is, is that Singapore is our, our equatorial study site. It's very close to the equator. Cairns then represents the southern hemisphere study site and then Guam being the northern hemisphere. And they have very uh, distinct reproductive um, outputs and, and traits based on the, you know, the, uh, the latitude. So that's why we're splitting the study areas in essence. They're all synchronous spawning. So it means that we know the moment they're going to spawn in the wild and work backwards. So Project Coral Singapore is a collaboration with um, Resort Swell Sentosa out in Singapore and um, the Seacore Foundation, which is actually based in, in Germany. But um, one of their um, principal scientists is he, he's um, is a postdoc researcher at the National University of Singapore, and he has focused on on reproduction of corals and knows the reefs in, in uh, around uh, Singapore incredibly well. So we're focusing on um, an acropora, which is again a branching but plating um, uh, species of coral. Uh, acroporas are the biggest group of, of reef building corals. They're also the ones that seem to get affected by climate change the most, so they're really important group to focus on. And really the goals of, of um, Project Coral Singapore are first work with uh, work towards captive in vitro fertilization. We're replicating the environmental conditions from, from Kusu Reef in Singapore in captivity. And then we're also mapping the production of eggs and sperm in the wild um, as well as in captivity. And then long term we're going to be looking at reef restoration. So material is going to be going back to Singapore and transplanted back onto the reef. And this is going to be potentially very important in light of uh, what may happen early next year. So, like I say, we spend about eight months getting government permits to, to collect and tag the corals. The species that we're collecting from are very large, sort of here to the end of the, end of the bench. So we were allowed to collect between 15 and 35 centimetre pieces from the parent colonies. The parent colonies have then been tagged and then the tags are obviously followed um, back to London. So we know where they've come from. We've got a map of the reef. Um, and then we're revisiting uh, the corals on the reef every month, sampled back in London at the same time, and then we're following through histology, that egg and sperm production as it goes through the year. But we collected in um, sort of midway through February. Um, and we did that because we knew spawning was going to occur in April. So we were specifically going for colonies that already had eggs. And the idea behind that is to first test how our microprocessors are running compared to Singapore. Um, we built a very crude nursery um, to allow the corals to heal after being removed from the parents um, and left them on the reef for about three weeks so they could heal up from the break. And then um, we in essence, ship them back to London. So sh shipping corals is really difficult. They get very stressed, especially pieces this big. So we, um, we had to work a lot with the water chemistry in the, um, in the transportation, add different buffers um, to ensure that they would basically turn up in Heathrow in, in optimal health. So the team out in Singapore, um, we packed up the corals, basically drew, drove them to the airport. I jumped on a plane. Um, behind them, in essence, they went on the cargo cargo flight, and I flew a couple of hours behind them, met them in uh, Heathrow, and then we drove them back to the, to the museum. So they literally came from the reef, so 
to London, 27 hours um, total time, which is brilliant that we could cut down the shipping time and reduce the stress. And then this is the, the system that's running as Singapore uh, back at the Horniman. So you know, this is on view to the public so they can, can see this work. Um, so in the build-up to spawning, we isolated the corals into individual um, tubs and then collected the gametes as they, they came out. What, um, what ended up happening is we, we caught one of the specimens and we worked for about seven nights in a row. And then this year, there's all, all around the world, a lot of sites are exhibiting something called split spawning. So where the full moon is quite late in the, in the month, some of the corals are basically saying we'll go, um, and this happened in, in uh, Singapore, some were going in April and then some were going in May. So we worked past the known date of spawning. One individual produced loads. Some of them were just trickling a few eggs out. And so we were assuming that it was going to be a split spawning. So we basically packed up shop on the, on the Friday night, and then 10 of them spawned on the Sunday night. We missed them. So it was an absolute shocker to, to miss it. But you know, unfortunately, things don't always go to plan when you're trying to develop these protocols. We've learned some hard lessons as a result of that. But it was still an amazing result to bring gravid colonies halfway around the world. Corals, if they get stressed, can reabsorb the eggs because they need to regain that energy to basically repair the damage. So we had to treat them with real kitten gloves to get them through this stress period. So the fact that we got eight, I mean, sort of 10 out of the 14 to spawn, even though we didn't catch it for the in vitro, it was, um, it was still a great, a great effort, I think. So moving forward, like I say, we're sampling each month um, and then we're preserving samples and running histology. So we've got to wait until April next year now. Um, and, you know, we think it's going to work, but again, it may not. We may be missing a trick in captivity. They, they're on a very strict diet, so we, they get isolated, fed very specific foods every day um, to mimic the same sort of um, nutritional input that would be taken in the wild. But one of the big threats could be that we're, we're missing a trick with the nutrition. Um, we'll see in April, basically. Um, but then the plan is that um, after the April spawning, because the corals are growing so quickly in, in, our, in our systems, we'll then break the colonies in half, and then one half will be shipped back to Resorts Royal Sentosa. They're building a replica system to mine in, in the Horniman. And so we'll have genetic material on the reef back in London and also in the aquarium in Singapore. So we'll, it'll strengthen the kind of... Um, you know, the, the, to be able to quantify whether we're actually cracking, cracking the protocols. And then, like I say, long term, the plan is once we've, we've got the in vitro fertilization, we get the young corals, then it opens up the possibility to start restoring damaged area of the reefs with the genetic material that's come from Singapore. Already we're finding that from this year, one, two of the colonies, um, so these are my colleagues um, sampling, the two of the colonies have already lost 50% of their tissue in, in this last year. So the fact that we're keeping this genetic material in captivity provides you know, an opportunity that if we lose these colonies out in the wild, we can then still transplant back out um, once this big bleaching event is over. So that's that Project Coral Singapore. Oh, this is um, you know, work that we're doing actually with Seacore Foundation. So, you know, I've learned a lot of the techniques of in vitro fertilization with, with uh, this organization, Seacor Foundation. And they have different sites around the world that they're, they're working on restoration efforts. So they perform the in vitro fertilization in labs next to the reef, um, settle them onto specific tiles, which are then put into a nursery for a period to grow out and then transplanted onto degraded areas of the reef in an effort to to basically build up the population. And they're working in the Philippines, Mexico, Curacao in the Caribbean, Guam. So if you're interested, have a look at their website. There's some, some great information there. And this is what we'd like to do, is develop this up in Singapore as well. So then Project Coral um, Australia is, is the, like I say, we're running a, a, a pilot um, the, the, you know, this year with a view of extending 
the reach of what we're trying to do with this into next year. We're working with different species, two different species. Um, I've had about 20 colonies shipped over from Australia in the last about six, uh, six weeks ago. And we're hoping, I've got to sample them tomorrow. They, I've got seven colonies at the moment that have got eggs. Um, we'll know tomorrow, looking at the colour of the eggs, we should get spawning in the next fortnight. Um, the, one of the learning curves that we, get, we, we, um, we learnt with missing the spawning is that we're now running the systems real time. So as the, as the sun rises in Australia, it does in, in the Horniman, which means that spawning will be during the day for us. So I don't have the pressure of staying late at work and, and missing it. It should happen uh, with, with this species on the, on the left. It should occur about 10 minutes to 12, um, and then the, the species next to it about half past one, um, if it goes to plan. And then, like I say, the view is to, to extend um, into the northern hemisphere and look at, um, at Guam as a possibility as well. But really, these, these relationships and these studies and projects only really work um, through the right um, relationships with different institutions. You have to have buy-in because it's impossible for someone, um, you know, an organization like the Horniman to be monitoring the reefs in Guam or Singapore, for instance. So Singapore has been a great learning curve. We've got some, some really important key partners there, and we, we, we look at developing those more. So the, the project has, has had some great coverage from, you know, we worked with the Natural History Museum last this year, just gone with a major exhibition about corals. Um, done some Radio 4 interviews and, and Nature did a podcast about it. So we're getting the message out there, which is fantastic. Um, I need to thank my corporate partners um, and also the scientific partners that are helping us um, study it. Thank you to all of you. <laughs>